Throughout history, there have been moments when the entirety of our global financial system seems woven together with the thinnest of threads, with little to stop it from completely unraveling. The 2008 crash was one such moment, but there was another, lost from recent memory, bound by striking similarities 100 years earlier. The panic of 1907 was triggered by the actions of a small group of wealthy financiers and brokers whose attempted corner of United Copper stocks pushed a delicately fragile market, already teetering on the edge of the abyss, into total chaos. And so if they could, in fact, increase the price of the stock because they felt they owned all the stock in United Copper, uh, it was going to do what's called squeezing the shorts. Unfortunately, they were wrong. They failed in their attempt and it became yet another trigger for then what became the cataclysm of the panic of 1907. Brokerages suspended from the New York Stock Exchange, bank runs across the nation, and bank failures globally. With no FDIC in place, millions of hard-earned dollars in savings accounts and nest eggs lost completely overnight to over-leveraged banks. In the early 21st century, the world marveled at the seemingly unstoppable rise of the global economy. But beneath the facade of wealth and prosperity lurked a series of events that would rock the financial world to its core. The original idea was, let's empower people to be able to get into homes. I think it started from a very good place, but what the financial industry is really good at doing is taking a really good idea and then hammering it so heavily and for so long that it becomes a really bad idea. And the ripple effects, the, the unintended consequences become magnified. The story of how the 2008 market crash unfolded is a tale of greed, speculation, high-risk financial tools, ill-prepared regulatory bodies, and an intricate web of interconnectedness between financial institutions, which, like dominoes, cascaded into global collapse. The Panic of 1907 and the Crash of 2008 typify the phrase boom and bust. In both cases, years of widespread profitability enticed many to take dangerous risks with other people's money. The late 19th and early 20th centuries marked a time of rapid industrialization. 170,000 miles of railroad were laid in the 30 years between 1870 and 1900. A sense of economic stability was forged when President McKinley signed a bill returning the U.S. to the gold standard. Major corporate consolidations across all industries reduced competition and increased profitability. Stocks soared and, as a result, there was a massive speculative boom, redirecting funds from the banking credit markets into the stock market. Edwin Lefevre, U.S. diplomat, financial writer, and author of Reminiscences of a Stock Operator wrote, There has been unprecedented activity and expansion in industries and manufacturers, not only in the United States, but also in Germany and England and France. In our country, because of the national optimism, the expansion has been extraordinary. The volume of business simply colossal. Our industries have grown at such a rate that we've been unable to properly finance that growth. We've had too much prosperity for the money, more than we could promptly pay for. You know, the period 1897 and 1906 was a period of clearly unprecedented growth uh, in the United States, the largest up to that time, and one of the most historic growth spurts in America's history ever, actually. Uh, we saw 38% growth in GDP, 16.8% uh, uh, compound annual growth rate in stock prices over that period, um, and all at the same time, over that time, nearly doubling of the gold supply in the United States, money flowing in uh, largely through the efforts of leading financiers into the United States. And this had all followed a series of effectively boom and bust cycles, depression and growth spurts, all throughout the period following the U.S. Uh, Civil War. Um, and when this started to occur, there was this feeling of buoyant, uh, almost giddy optimism about the growth of the economy. And that really set the stage for what was to come uh, at this moment in you know, 1906, on the verge of 07, uh, before things really started to change. Author and investment advisor John Markman wrote, add to this the advent of the trust company, 
which collected deposits and resembled a bank, but undertook much more speculative investments and operated without regulatory oversight, and the financial system was left in a very vulnerable state. Like the economic climate leading up to the 2008 crash, the tidal wave of prosperity and spending blinded many to the signs that the high tide of credit availability was receding. Bringing the U.S. back to the gold standard like much of the developed world at the time meant that economic growth, like paper money, was tied to the amount of gold on hand, and a country's gold supply was limited to the success of gold mining and the cross-border flow of gold reserves. This also meant that countries shared a finite supply of money. At the time, an ongoing British war against the Bowers in South Africa was not only pulling massive amounts of gold out of their coffers, but also disrupted the region's gold mining operations, impacting the global gold supply. Russia and Japan sold bonds across Europe to fund their battling forces in the Russo-Japanese War for control over parts of northern China and the Korean Peninsula. Alexander Noyce, distinguished American financial columnist, estimated that roughly $1 billion was spent on pure waste. It does not return to the channels of industry, and it diminishes the world's reserve of capital. Despite the pressure on the banking system, the speculative boom continued at pace. By the winter of 1905, the cash reserves of New York banks fell below the 25% ratio to deposits required by the National Bank Act. A few days after interest rates on some loans reached 125%, Jacob Schiff, a prominent U.S. banker at the time, told the New York Chamber of Commerce, If the currency conditions of this country are not changed materially, I predict that you will have such a panic in this country as will make all previous panics look like child's play. On April 17, 1906, a singularly calamitous act of nature caused the credit bubble to contract within a hair's breadth of collapsing. Just after 5 a.m. local time, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit the San Francisco Bay Area. Accounts from the time show that tremors could be felt from southern Oregon to Los Angeles and as far inland as central Nevada, an area of approximately 200,000 miles. The city was ravaged with its mostly wood-based architecture standing or shaken to rubble, becoming merely thousands of tons of kindling for the apocalyptic fires that followed. It's estimated that 90% of the destruction was caused by the fires alone, which were mercilessly fed by ruptured gas lines. Residents and firefighters looked on in horror and dismay, powerless to fight the hellish blazes, given that the quake had damaged much of the city's water infrastructure. The property loss was estimated at $400 million at the time, the equivalent of over $12 billion in 2022. The cataclysmic devastation wrought upon San Francisco by the earthquake and subsequent fires sent equally damning aftershocks through the global financial ecosystem. Insurance companies from New York to London were consumed with claims, which in some cases surpassed their capacity to pay out. Between late April and May of 1906, nearly $50 million of gold poured into the United States from Germany, France, the Netherlands, and England, whose contribution alone amounted to $30 million. Again, John Markman wrote, As gold flowed from London to San Francisco to settle fire insurance claims following the earthquake, a liquidity crisis began. The huge outflow of wealth tightened monetary conditions in England to such an extent that the Bank of England was forced to double its discount rate in an attempt to attract foreign gold. Eventually, the Bank of England retaliated by instituting a discriminatory policy against capital flows to the United States. This effectively cut off gold exports and pushed the American economy into a recession. With no gold flowing from London, the New York financial markets were extremely vulnerable as interest rates were raised in an effort to restock the depleted gold reserves. The need for more money on hand hit stock exchanges around the world, as banks and other major investors sold out of their stock holdings to increase their liquidity. Fear spread as prices dropped across the boards. 
Even as the chaos of the quake and fire turned into the laborious trudge of reconstruction, the market stayed tense and retracted, eventually leading to a silent crash on the U.S. stock markets in March of 1907. The markets, foreign and domestic, remained on a knife's edge, and all that was needed was a little push. It was the actions of two would-be kings, F. Augustus Hines, known as the Copper King, and Charles W. Morris, the Ice King, that tipped the scales. Their hubris set in motion a chain of events that would finally break the beleaguered global financial system. Frederick Augustus Hines was born one of three sons into a wealthy immigrant family in the late 1860s. He developed an interest in mining while studying at the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. He graduated from the Columbia School of Mines and moved west to Colorado and eventually to Butte, Montana to work as a mining engineer for the Boston and Montana Mining Company. Soon, Hines had built quite a reputation for himself, both professionally and socially. With a $50,000 inheritance from his father's passing, Hines acquired a majority stake in the Montana Ore Purchasing Company. He put his engineering education and practical mining experience to work acquired a sophisticated new smelter that could produce copper from very low-grade ore. In time, his business ventures became a competitor with the area's largest and most powerful mining operation, Amalgamated Copper, owned by John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil. Using mergers, legal guile, political savvy, and more nefarious tactics, Heinz's copper empire grew as quickly as his list of enemies. Amalgamated wanted to monopolize the copper industry in Montana, and as it bought more and more mines in the area, their battles with Hines intensified and dragged on for years. Through the General Mining Act of 1872, commonly known as the Apex Law, it was possible for a mine owner to shut down competing mining interests. Augustus Hines was nothing if not aggressive. Uh, for instance, you know, during his time as he gained in the growth of his uh, copper mining, uh, he took full advantage of uh, what was largely known as the Apex Law. And he became, Augustus Hines, became very skilled and highly litigious, um, hiring as many as 37 lawyers at one point to sue the owners of the lands and mines surrounding them, basically putting a pause on their ability to make money from their mines. That's how he gained, in his view, competitive advantage. Was it right or wrong? Well, it was in the bounds of the law. Hines stretched the law to its limits by strategically buying up land near other mining operations and then tying them up in litigation. In 1902, Hines consolidated his various mining interests into the United Copper Company, valued at $80 million, cementing his place as one of the three Copper Kings. Shortly after, he attempted his mine raid tactic on amalgamated copper. The incident escalated into a violent clash between mining crews. Miners used high-pressure hoses, threw grenades, burnt rubber, and spread caustic chemicals to force their rivals out of the mine shafts. Before the event ended, Hines extracted 100,000 tons of high-grade copper ore. Dynamite was used during the incident, caving in the property which destroyed any evidence of wrongdoing. Hines was cited with contempt of court, but was only hit with a fine for his role in the melee. Hines had made such a nuisance of himself over a decade of their fierce mining war that the Amalgamated Copper Company offered to buy Hines out of most of his Montana mining operations. For Hines's part, the deal was an easy way out of mounting legal woes. After heated negotiations, Hines settled with Amalgamated for the price of $12 million, which he took with him back home to New York City in pursuit of his next great conquest, Wall Street. <laughs> 